Uh, good morning. Uh, I have, I'm unofficially taking over the introductory uh, task here to uh, get things started so we can start not too late. Uh, I'm happy to be here to introduce uh, John Farajan, who will be giving one of uh, the Empire Lecture Series. There's lectures being given on a regular cycle all, uh, all today and then um, tomorrow afternoon as well. And if you look at the lineup, it's a pretty impressive group of people who are going to be speaking. Uh, and John is among the most impressive of them. He's currently at NYU Law School. Uh, he was, uh, he's retired from Stanford. He was sort of dominating both places for a while and, uh, and now has kind of released Stanford and is uh, 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 located primarily in New York. Um, you uh, are no doubt familiar with his work. It covers a, an incredible range of um, ideas and approaches to studying things political and things legal. Uh, and I haven't reviewed his latest CV, so I can't tell you what he's done most recently. But uh, I can say that I'm still citing work that he published 40 years ago uh, in current things that I write. So, and and that's, there are not too many people in that position. So uh, without further ado, I would invite John to talk to us. Thank you for coming. <laughs> You're the brave and the few. Uh, this is a project that I'm doing, writing jointly with uh, Roderick Hills at NYU Law School, and it is uh, a project about the Federalist Papers, and it was in response to a request by Jack Rakoff, who's the eminent scholar of, Jack's, of uh, James Madison, who sometimes thinks of himself as the second coming of James Madison, um, and, um, and he's, he's editing a volume on the, Edel, on the Federalist Papers, and he asked me to do a paper on political science in the Federalist. So I agreed to do that. I haven't shown this to Jack yet, so uh, we'll see if he's gonna publish it or not. Uh, but I got more fond of it. Uh, the reason he may not publish it is that Madison doesn't come out quite the way Jack thinks he comes out. Uh, so let me just tell you the project. So I'm, I'm thinking about the Federalist Papers as having um, three components. Uh, one component is normative, that is to say, you know, a, a normative polemical, which is to say a, def, a defense of the constitutional, the constitution is drafted in Philadelphia and, a, and an expl explanation to the voters of, or to the people of New York as to why they should approve the constitution and join the, the federation. Um, it was, as part of that uh, argumentation, it had political science and that is to say empirically testable propositions embedded in it. It also had positive theories embedded in it. As, as well as it has, it had normative theories. Now I believe, and I think the, what I'm gonna to present today is gonna to support this idea, that um, the principal difference between the writers, I'm gonna focus on Hamilton and Madison, was mostly normative. That is to say they had different objectives that they expected and hoped the federal government, the newly created federal government would fulfill. Um, but I think they shared to a great extent the, their political science. That is, I think they, they agreed on the theories that they thought, um, largely agreed on the theories that they thought supported, uh, uh, provided empirical support based on their previous read, you know, readings and experiences with the states, with the uh, conduct of the, of the national government during the war and afterwards under the articles, um, and uh, their readings about uh, classical republics, about contemporary European states, et cetera. So I think they agreed on a lot of the political science, but I want to articulate what that political science was because I don't think they agree completely, right? So, so I want to think of political science for this point of view as having several elements. <clears throat> one, what, for, for the standpoint of, the, of, the, of Publius, which is one are propositions about human nature, that is what people are like, right? And I think both of them have what I would call an Augustinian view of human nature, that is man has fallen that, and, but, they, but, but the fall was in slightly different directions, and I think this is interesting. So for Madison, man was fallen in the sense that his self-interest was sometimes so prominent in his mind that he couldn't get it out of, his, out of the way. So, so Madison was you know, worried when he was in the Continental Congress and annoyed when he was in the Continental Congress that the states which had promised uh, to uh, send requisitioned money and troops to the army uh, would only do that when the British were nearby. So in the beginning of the war, which the war was initially fought in the north, uh, the southern states were shirking. And when the British were, armies moved south, the northern states were shirking. So he just saw this pattern of, you know, uh, 
you know, people not disagreeing, not saying it's a bad idea to send the troops, but oh, maybe next week the checks in the mail, don't worry about it. So there's this sort of sense that the sort of narrow self-interest was so dominating that it prevented fulfillment of agreements, even when people could agree in general that it was a good idea to fulfill those commitments. Hamilton's was a little bit different. Hamilton, you can see this in Federalist 70, worries about men who, um, who can't agree because they're too proud to agree. That is, if it was their idea, and everybody recognizes it's their idea, they do it. But if, they, if it wasn't their so it was pride that was a problem for Hamilton. It wasn't self-interest, it was pride and vanity. You know, so, so I think those are two different ideas you can find Augustinian roots for, but they are different. I mean, they, they both have an idea that, that there's a problem coordinating activity, but they are different problems a little bit. But they both see you know, this soul of fallen nature. And so I think that's part of the political science is a proposition about human nature. That's not a part that for either of them is up for testing. <laughs> That I think they would believe that, they believed that before, they had those beliefs before the, before the ratification, they had them afterwards, and nothing they saw would persuade them to drop those deep, empirically testable, but not tested beliefs about human nature, because there were so many other hypotheses that could be rejected before that one would be rejected. And of course, the principal one there was, how would a government work? And they had different starting beliefs about how republics work. And this is where I think there was an important uh, agreement among them, you know, and one that uh, prized apart a little bit as time went on. And that was, and I call this sort of their political sociology of republics, all right? So, so both Hamilton and Madison, as almost anybody who wrote about this in the 18th century thought, that the, the most important power for a government was the legislative power. When it, was a, when it was a monarchy, of course, the monarchy had the legislative, so that was an important power, and it was dangerous. It could usurp... Uh, powers, as the Stuart kings had done, for, you know, away from parliament or away from the courts or whatever. But, but, but when you have a republic, then the legislative is separated from, in principle, from the executive. And the legislative remains the most important power, right? So it's the power that is uh, most likely to cause trouble for the design of a republic. And of course, the constitution designed a republic, if anything was, all right? So, so the whole point of that view about, so, so the question is, why is that, all right? So they had a Madison articulated a theory about why that would be, which was the problem with the legislative in a republic is that it's the closest to the people. That is to say, the members of the legislature, especially the lower chamber of the legislature, are back in the districts under the constitutional design. Every two years, people will know them. The districts aren't that big, so they'll be familiar, and they'll enjoy the confidence of the people. And as you move up the ladder, first to the, to the Senate and then to executive Officials, those are distant people. So they won't attract much sympathy so, or knowledge or empathy or anything. So, so the view was the, the power of the legislative is partly its, its granted powers as a legal matter, what, power, what, what it can do, that is, what actions it can take. And secondly, that its closeness to the people evokes their sympathy, is likely to evoke their sympathy, and so it's dangerous because it has the people behind them. So, so I think that's... I think they shared that view, that the legislative is the most powerful branch, and that explains a lot of the design of the Constitution as they understood it and defended it, which was break it in two, um, er elected on different electoral bases, uh, even on different population bases, although Madison demurred on that issue, um, give the president a role in, in, in the legislative directly, uh, give the judiciary, as Hamilton argued explicitly, and as I think Madison would have, did agree as when he, insofar as he wrote about this, uh, give the judiciary an ex post check on legislation. So you surround the legislature with bodies capable of either stopping it from legislating or, or altering what it says. Now, it's not, one more thing before I go on beyond the legislature. All the things I just said about the legislature at the national level are true in spades at the state level because the districts are even smaller, the elections are often more frequent, uh, the states are on you know, uh, you know they, re they hold the residual powers, especially the police powers, et cetera. They have access to the militia, which they both, Hamilton and Madison, thought was an enormous power for them. Um, so so the, the danger of the people and the danger of the legislative is, is exacerbated at the states. And, and when, insofar as they wrote about state government experiences under the articles or before, they saw that as most, mostly as exemplifying the dangers of a popular branch, namely lower chambers of the legislature. And so... So anyway, so that so there's so there's one theory is the legislature is more pow most powerful in a republic in any republic, right? The second and, and the and the grounds for that thinking is the people are the most um, are the source of closest to the people is the most dangerous feature that that the legislative has a specific 
branch has a specific attachment to. So, and of course, then it, okay, so that's, um, so, so that goes far in explaining one feature of the Constitution which is defended in Madison's papers, 51, and, other, and associated papers, which I'm not gonna describe right now, but basically, they explain why when you're designing institutions to stabilize the distribution of powers that are given in the Constitution, put a lot of checks on the legislature, which I just described, you know, and if anything, put fewer checks or not very, not very many checks, and it's not very important how you check either the executive or the, or the judiciary. So Ham, Madison, like um, uh, Montesquieu 50 years before, thought that the executive power is a simple power, easily controlled. Um, you know, it's basically to carry out, to take care of the, the uh, uh, statutes or carry, or, or in the Constitution are faithfully carried out. So it's not, you know, it's basically a clerk's job. You know, it's like, so he may have to execute laws, but he certainly has no positive role in enacting them. At least that's what he thought in 1787 and 88. Um, so no problem with the executive, even less with the least dangerous branch, which Hamilton called the judiciary. So, so not necessary really to impose important checks on the authorities there. Right, so that's that. So that's the, the consequence of believing the legislature is dangerous relative to the other branches. Check the legislature. Don't worry too much about the other branches. Um, so, associated with that, and it's said many times by by both of them, is a worry about the people themselves. All right. So, and if you look at Madison's inside the Federalist Papers, two of the most explicit things he said about it were, first of all, a long and sort of puzzling essay in Federal, called Federalist 49, where he states Thomas Jefferson's belief that the Constitution ought to have, ought to be revisited from time to time in a popular manner. That is to say, referred periodically to the people for their agreement, concurrence, reaffirmation, assent, whatever you want. Uh, and Madison in 49 refutes that. And he basically says, that would be a dangerous idea. You know, it would destabilize, you know, beliefs about obedience in government and faith in institutions. It would rob the institution of the veneration that time bestows on all things, is the phrase he used. So he says, bad to have the people there. Um, subsequently, in Federalist 63, he, in a paper about the Senate, he uh, articulates what he thinks is the genius of the document, which is to leave no role for the people in the regular operation of government at all. That is to say, it's a government of representatives. It's not a government of the people, and the people have no role in it at all, except possibly to elect members if the states permit it. Right? So, so, for example, at that point, you know, most of the states, after the Constitution got going, didn't permit elections for presidential electors. They chose them by state legislatures. Only two states you know, had direct elections for, ele for presidential electors. So it was kind of up to the states how much of a role people actually played in setting up the governmental in parts of the institution. So, so, you know, Madison plainly at that point was anti-democratic in the sense of not envisioning a role for the people either constitutionally or in terms of regular operation of government. Um, now, of course, Hamilton's view, and I, it's, this is conjecture, uh, all of what I say is conjecture, but it's, I think it's all true conjecture, but, but um, Hamilton's view about the executive was not that it was, he probably wouldn't have thought it was necessarily simple. He just thought, he thought it was, as you could see in, in the writings he did on the executive, um, it was filled with opportunity. <laughs> you know, there are many things the executive could do, and he thought for the Republic to succeed in the context in which it found itself, that is surrounded by hostile forces in all directions, it would have to become economically powerful and develop a powerful military capacity. And, and to do that, there had to be an executive capable of acting what he called energetically, that is to say a single person, elected on relatively long terms, for in his case, he preferred life term, uh, or infinite elections and even life, if you, if you could get it. Um, so he wanted an executive that, and, and, the, and the grounds for it were the grounds that Madison had already articulated, which is, in 51, which is, which is you want a president who's energetic and is seen to be responsible for the conduct of uh, keeping, for keeping the nation safe against essentially, especially foreigners and domestic insurrection and to be held responsible for it, to be accountable for it in the popular mind. So Madison's theory, Hamilton's theory of the executive in 70 was really a filling out of a theory that Madison already put out in 51, which is you want accountability for an energetic executive. But I think they disagreed in terms of where that would lead. I think Madison thought it would you know, lead to responsible execution of laws, and Hamilton was really envisioning 
the executive operating in areas where laws did not bind, namely in foreign affairs. That is to say, treaties might bind, but normally, you know, the, you know congressional statutes don't normally have application overseas, except for in special cases. So, so ordinarily, the, the, you know, the laws wouldn't necessarily bind. The president would have to take actions unconstrained by law. He'd be exercising what Locke had called the federative power, something which Montesquieu seemed to forget and which neither Madison nor Hamilton explicitly addressed either. It was an area which Locke recognized was not re regulated by parliament. It was an, an area of prerogative for, you know, in, a, in Locke's writing. So, all right, so then, so, so anyway, so that, so, the two main theories are why the legislature is powerful and, and why the people ought properly to be excluded from government. Um, you can see uh, there are other theories. Th these were not unusual theories in the, in the 18th century. If you read Kant's Perpetual Peace, he articulates a reason for thinking that any democracy that has any, play, any system in which the people have a direct role uh, in executing laws is necessarily despotic. And so he has a general purpose argument that Republican rule, which he thinks is the best kind of rule, ought to be conducted by representatives with no role for the people. It was a common view in the 18th century. Uh, Montesquieu had a you know, similar view. So, so now what happened? So now, you know, since I'm treating these claims as, as testable in principle, at least in experience, I want to look at rapidly at the experience of the first 10 years of the Constitution from when it's ratified in 1780 to about 1800, and I want to sh show that because of the failure of Madison's, in particular, political science, the, 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 that his predictions largely turned out to be incorrect, um, he was forced to a very different position with respect to how the Constitution ought to be thought about and how it ought to operate going forward. And he was wrong, and so, so if you remember, the overall design was, um, uh, we, it's safe, for the liberties of the people and of the states, and the authorities of the states, to have a large republic. Uh, and, um, the, and the grounds for that are articulated in Federalist 10. And they come to the proposition that in a large republic, it's going to be very difficult for self-seeking or, or despotic majorities to take control of the government and enact tyrannical legislation. That was the reason, right? So, so you're basically making it difficult to form coalitions, right? And, and then, if you remember the design elements or the defensive design in Federalist 51 and the papers before that and after that, mostly by Madison, are basically what he calls auxiliary precautions. That is, if it were the case that despite the protections that would naturally be there in the political sociology of Federalist 10, if they fail, then we design checks and balances and other things to prevent the uh, imposition of, of despotic laws, which will probably come from the legislature, the most dangerous branch. So, so the design is of, of, the, of, of, the, of the, the argumentation is a defense of a large republic, which he thinks will largely be self-policing all by itself without checks and balances. But if it happens to fail, here's some checks and balances too, and especially against the Congress. So that's kind of the overall pattern, right? And, so the, and then, of course, and the pattern is the checks and balances are not, there's not many against the president's authority, which is fairly unspecified, right? There's a, there's a take care clause, there's commander in chief clause, treaty powers, all pretty much unspecified, at least at that moment. So, so when the Constitution gets going, um, Madison is and Hamilton are allied on the first major issue that comes up, which is as to whether the president can remove high officials without consulting the Senate. And there was a big fight in Congress about this, and, and uh, Madison, I mean, Hamilton, of course, was in favor of the president's having as much power as possible, so of course he could remove high officials. Uh, and Madison, having defended the idea of an accountable president, you know, felt, for various reasons, bound to go along. You know, so he agreed the president ought to have the authority to, uh, to fire high officials. I mean, high officials means those that have already been appointed by the Senate, with the concurrence of the Senate, without asking the Senate to fire them. Right? So, it's, so it's basically, it was unspecified what would happen in the document, and, and, that, and, that, was, and that was the view that prevailed. And so the president was, from that moment on, entitled to f fire such officials if he wanted. Right, um, but that was really the last time that Madison found himself on the same side as a fight as Hamilton, and the the, the other fights had to do, as you're sure you're familiar, first of all with the creation of a national bank, um, and the funding essentially of the of, this, of the war debt, that is the assumption of the debt by the national government, and especially in this case, the conduct of foreign policy embodied in the Neutrality Pro Proclamation in 1792, I think. And, or maybe 93, one of the two, and 
and the uh, uh, negotiation and ratification of the Jay Treaty. So let me just talk about the latter ones first. These were deeply shocking to Madison. All right, the United States had had a treaty with France in 1778. It was by means of that treaty that the Americans were able to defeat the British. Without that, there was no way the revolution was succeeded, and everybody knew it on both sides, right? And the treaty wasn't a, wasn't a, a defense treaty, but it was a kind of most favored nations treaty, right? And the, new, the neutrality proclamation had been debated in cabinet, you know, and Jefferson, of course, was there, Secretary of State, and, uh, and the argument was with Hamilton again, and Washington, and Washington went with Hamilton and unilaterally declared neutrality, which was understood by Americans and by the French as an act of hostility, because it basically, basically said that the British, which were the dominant force on the seas, would um, be permitted to do whatever they wanted with, with American as well as French shipping if the shipping was directed to French ports in the Caribbean or in Europe, all right? So, so it, was, it was thought to be uh, you know, a major concession to the British, and Madison did not believe it was constitutional. I mean, he thought, he thought when it comes to abrogating a treaty, that seems to him like an, ex you know, an exercise of treaty power, which requires the participation of the Senate. And of course, the Senate had no participation in that. It was a debate in cabinet, and Washington issued the proclamation. All right, so that was the first real evidence that even a man as venerated by Madison as George Washington was, as a, as a true Republican, as the, as the contemporary Cincinnatus, you know, uh, that, that in his hand, even in his hands, which are the safest possible hands for the executive power, that he didn't understand it. He didn't understand its extent and how it could be understood by, you know, legally and constitutionally by well-meaning people like Washington as empowering him to unilaterally take actions, which Madison thought any plain reading of the Constitution would say were, you know, required a different reading, a reading that said the, the Senate ought to have a role. Right after that, Washington said, sent John Jay to London to negotiate a treaty, and the treaty was negotiated in secret with the British, which made further concessions, many more further, further concessions to the British. Um, and uh, the treaty came back, was ratified by the Senate in secret, signed by the President in secret, was not learned about by Madison until the following summer, when it became clear, it was announced <laughs> in legislative proposals, that the House of Representatives was supposed to initiate money bills to fund the execution of certain aspects of those, those treaties. You know, so so it needed there, there needed to be you know construction of or deconstruction of forts and, and other things, and there were nu numerous things that needed appropriated funds, and it was a duty of the House. And Madison was apoplectic about this. He was a member of the House. You know, he, he said, you know, you're telling me that that you have this sec secret process. Which is essentially a legislative process, you know, which now, which now binds Americans, private and public, you know, private merchant mariners, you know, to different legislative behavior, legislative in treaty now, um, and you're saying that now that, that the House has an obligation on, under pain of treason to enact facilitating legislation, you know, he just thought that was just an amazing coup, you know. Again, this is a, this is a second blow for him about the or lesson to him that the executive power was not what he thought it was at all, you know? And he articulated in a series of publications, um, uh, you know, a, a different theory of how to understand the presidential power. And of course it was not prevailing, you know, it didn't prevail at the time, but it's a very well articulated theory. And it basically, and it's coming back now incidentally at this, this very week in terms of the role of Congress with respect to the treaty or the international negotiations with Iran about the, in, in this exact, and if you look at Madison's writings on this in various publications, which are reprinted in various places, uh, he addresses issues that are, you, you can recognize today about you know, what the congressional role would be or ought to be when it comes to treaty uh, obligations. What's interesting about it, though, is that he articulates this theory that the treaty power is essentially a legislative process, and, um, and it's essentially a much more powerful legislative process than the ordinary legislative process, and raises the question of what to do when they conflict. You know, and that's not addressed, and it's, okay, so, so that's, that's the lessons he learned about the, about the executive and why it might have been a good idea to think a little harder about, about how an executive would behave in a Republican structure. So I think he was wrong to think it was an easy office to control or that it would be self-regulating, and so he saw, saw it now as a source of danger that he had not anticipated. Now, if you see in his moves, these were publications, arguments in Congress, which didn't work. Um, his moves were um, having failed to design the appropriate institution to articulate a mode of constitutional interpretation 
that would give him an ex post way to address failures of design, right? So that's, that is a move, and we'll see that again in just a second in, the, in another domain, which is you know, the idea that, okay, the, the design is at least ambiguous and well-meaning men like Washington can get it wrong, so we ought to be articulating theories of interpretation that at least give guidance as to how the, the document ought to be you know, uh, understood, right? But the appeal is to either, you know, it's mostly to, at least directly, to other congressmen, to Washington, to Jefferson at the administration, to Hamilton. Uh, in other words, it's, it's aimed to, among the elites. You know, it's, a, it's an interpretive strategy, and possibly to judges if things ever get to court. But, but it's, it's within the sort of narrow governing elite where these interpretive moves are made. Um, so the second area was, which I think the bank bill is the best example. So, so you may know that you know, Hamilton advances this idea of having a national bank, a charting of that national bank, and he gives reasons, pragmatic reasons, why it would be a good idea, and, um, um, and Madison opposes it in, in the House, and he opposes it on the grounds that, well, look, we discussed the option of having, in Article One, Section 8, of giving to Congress the authority to charter corporations, and we dismissed that idea in, the, in Philadelphia. And the reason we dismissed it was partly because possibly we thought it would be too powerful an instrument to put in the hands of a new national government, but mostly because we knew we'd never get the Constitution ratified with such a provision. It would just remove the chartering power from the states in, fell, in one fell swoop and give it to the national government. That would be a recipe for, for losing the whole thing. So of course we didn't do that. So now how in the world can we charter a bank which is a corporation? You know, if we, if we don't have the general power, why do we have the specific power? You know, so, so that didn't work. <laughs> so they charted, so the, the, the Congress chart, charted the bank. And the lesson Madison learned from that, or one lesson he learned from it was that, or at least the way I see it, is that, that he thought, his explanation about why a bank was created was that um, it, it was, you know, pragmatically useful for the national government, but it was fantastically useful for the urban financial interests and bankers. You know, that is, it created essentially a de facto paper currency it, that, is, that is in loans that would be made and could be used as negotiable instruments. And so it effectively circumvented the coinage parts of the Constitution. It was, you know, facilitating, you know, trade and commerce at high levels. And so he, he saw it as a usurpation of authority by financial interests, you know. Now, of course, they're a minority. <laughs> you know, he, he recognizes that's a minority interest. Right? If you remember in Federalist 10, the whole design in Federalist 10 is to, is to say that it's okay to have a large republic because it will prevent majority takeover. He says, no need to worry about minority takeover. The Republican principle will defeat minority schemes. Right? So don't even worry about that. Right? But here he saw with the bank bill, and incidentally with the assumption of the debt as well, here was a scheme that was in the interest of, and he thought relatively the narrow material interest of a minority, and it worked. How did they do that? In other words, the scheme of making majorities hard to form seemed to, it, it, didn't, it didn't work against a minority. <laughs> you know, so, so, it, and so a fortiori, it's not gonna work against a well-funded majority either, right? It was pretty clear that Federalist 10 was not, was not really the powerful uh, political sociology that he thought it was. That isn't gonna stop nefarious plots in, in favor of private interests, right? So, and so that meant, all the weight goes on the auxiliary precautions, on the checks and balances, right? So that's what we've already talked a little bit about, one of them, the ones against the national government. So here was a reason to think that the primary precaution, that is a large and uh, compound republic, was not gonna be proof against minority-dominated legislation, and in particular, minority-dominated legislation favorable to commercial and industrial interests. And I think here, um, so again, as I said, in, in, in his defense against the bank bill, he used an interpretive strategy saying, you know, we can't charter corporations, how can we charter this corporation? Uh, that didn't work. He used the same strategy, as I said, against, against the um, uh, broadened assertion of executive power, and that didn't work either, right? So, so the final thing that happened uh, that I'm gonna talk about here is the enactment of the Alien and Sedition Act. So, the, so the war in Europe is going on, right? It starts in 1792, it, gets, it goes up and down. Both the British and French are recruiting either by force or by cajoling Americans to fight in the war. They do it on the, the British do it on the high sea by impressing American merchant 
Marine people into the British Navy on land. Various agents come here to try to recruit people to fight uh, and to contribute, actually, to the war effort. So to their war efforts, either French or British, on both sides. And there's scandals on both sides. You can read about them. So, so the Federalists are in control and under the Adams administration, and they enact some legislation, Alien and Sedition Acts, which are aimed to um, uh, uh, deal with some of these issues, the idea that there's kind of fifth columns arising within the American context. Some of them are aliens, actually, and some of them are, are working in cahoots with, let's say, the French, and these are mostly newspaper editors publishing articles critical of the Adams administration. So, so they outlaw that you know, kind of thing on the Sedition Act. Again, these are actions that Madison was convinced were plainly unconstitutional, and he could see that the Federalist judiciary not only didn't hear any cases at the level of Supreme Court, but that the members of the court writing circuit were often, or sometimes, extremely enthusiastic enforcers of the Sedition Act, especially, locking up uh, Republican editors here and there. So, so there was no relief to be gotten from the Supreme Court's authority to check legislation if it so chose, right? Um, so uh, at this point, uh, there, were two there were two states that were under control of the Republicans, and that was Virginia and Kentucky. Kentucky had been, until recently, part of Virginia. Um, and they get these two legislatures of those states to introduce legislation uh, uh, calling on other states to take some action to interpose between to interpose on the enforcement, against the enforcement of these unconstitutional acts, right? So it's always been unclear what exactly they meant by interpose. Uh, actually, the Kentucky Resolution says even more, it says nullify, but let's just focus on interpose. Um, and I think there's two interpretations that would make sense. One is that it's an invocation of, of at least one mode of constitutional change in Article 5, that it's, it's asking the other states to take an action that would amount to forming a new convention for the purpose of revising, the, uh, revising or amending the Constitution. So that would be an Article 5 route. And, and on the other hand, if you read what Madison, what, if you read the resolutions, they are phrased in a more popular sense in which saying that, that the people retain the right to alter or abolish the government, which is plainly not a constitutional right. That is, it's nowhere in the Constitution that you have the right to abolish. Right? So if you, have, if you retain a fundamental right to alter or abolish, then it means it can't be a constitutional or purely constitutional claim. So on that, on that account, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions might have been a call to essentially pre-constitutional understandings, pre in the sense of more fundamental than constitutional. I, don't, I mean, I have no position on which it really was, because in any event, the other states ignored, um, some actually spat on <laughs> these, these invitations to take some action to interpose themselves. And so that went no place. So at this point, uh, it's clear that none of the auxiliary precautions that were envisioned, none of the checks that were designed would work either. So you had the failure of Federalist 10 and you had the failure of the auxiliary precautions to protect against what are thought to be despotic or unconstitutional actions. <clears throat> and so at this point, Madison and Jefferson embark on what they, I think they think is the only possible role, which is to go to the elections, to get rid of the Federalists, to get rid of the Adams administration, and to get rid of the Federalist control of the instruments of national government, and hopefully the states as well. So they embark on this on a campaign in, in what was after, I think called even maybe at the time or somewhat afterwards, the Revolution of 1800, the first orderly transition, peaceful transition of you know, opposing parties from one party to another. So, so, uh, but, but I think what's important from the standpoint of uh, constitutional thinking is this amounted to Madison's recanting of uh, two of his most fundamental beliefs that are articulated in Federalist 49 and 63. That is, now there would be a role for the people, a regular role for the people. First of all, they could replace the government. They could, they would, that's a role they had. And now the government, of course, organized as a party, that is, as a Federalist party, controlled the instruments. It could remove that party. You know, it could remove it if it behaved in a certain way in an electoral process, which it successfully did, right? But the second thing is, and which I think Madison would never have dreamt of, is the election of 1800 actually was an appeal to the people to play a constitutional role. Because what was at stake was an interpretation of the Constitution, a Federalist interpretation, which thought of the acts by the executive and, and by the legislature enacting the Alien and Sedition Acts as constitutional acts. And ultimately, 
the guardian of the Constitution. The, the entity that had the power to reject that interpretation was the people. And I think at that point, it was clear that Madison's theory of the Constitution, his normative theory of the Constitution, was a little bit different than it had been in 1788. It was a theory, and it's, and it's where Publius is divided into two pieces. That is, Hamilton saw all these same events and thought, oh, those are good. <laughs> you know, I mean, up to 1800, right? And Madison saw all these things that the others are bad. And then they had a fight, effectively, in the election of 1800. And the people effectively decided, at least for a time, you know, that, that the appropriate way to think of the Constitution is the, is the way the Anti-Federalists had, had worried and thought about it before the ra constitutional ratification. And Madison was on their side at this point. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a real watershed in terms of uh, understanding the role of the people. I think it's a, it's a step in the direction of democracy. That is in the, in the sense that, that the people have a regular role to play in, in the conduct of government, you know, even if it's rare and, it's in, in, and only in certain circumstances can they do it. But, but here, you know, and of course, making that possible was a role that the leaders, leadership of Madison and, and uh, Jefferson made possible, but it was still a, a different kind of role for the people. It's a, a role where the people are central to um, making regular decisions in government, namely replacing officials, and especially altering uh, constitutional understandings, you know, by effectively rejecting in the right way uh, those who perpetrate what they think of as, or convinced are unconstitutional schemes. So that's, and so I think that, so I think that that whole transition from the kind of narrow republicanism that Madison and Hamilton agreed on in, you know, 1788, to one in which they split, you know, in which Hamilton re re stays with a kind of narrow conception of republicanism, which has no solid uh, popular base in this way, and Madison is, is different, turned on developments in on the, on the, uh, developments that had to do with the, with positive beliefs about about what would be true in a republic. That is to say, it turned out that the republic did not work, in fact, the way Madison thought it would work. In other words, the political science was wrong, and so he. He revised the political science. <laughs> so, so as uh, I think Nelson Polsby once said, echoing, uh, what's his name, uh, um, Samuel Johnson, is that it? Who is it? Uh, Samuel, well, anyway, Nelson said it anyway, copying somebody else, that uh, when accused of changing his mind, he says, well, the facts change. Why shouldn't I change my mind? Wouldn't you? <laughs> so, so Madison, in light of changing facts, had changed his mind. I don't think he changed his normative beliefs at all. At least you don't need to assume that. I don't think he changed his beliefs about human nature at all, but he changed his beliefs about how a Republican government, especially this Republican government that he was defending in 1788, would work. And when it didn't work that way, he changed his mind about, about, about a pivotal role of the people in essentially determining or at least influencing the way the Constitution is understood. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do I take questions? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting, very enlightening. I, just very quickly, just a couple of points. One, uh, Hamilton was just as shocked as Madison was uh, at the break between them. Uh, I think, because uh, I, 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 Hamilton agreed with you, and I agree with you as well, that they shared so much. I think Hamilton ended up being extremely surprised by how clueless Madison was in his view on how the world worked and what you needed to do in terms of public policy in terms of how the national government, what, what it's going to have to do and how it's going to operate. Mm -hmm. And absolutely right about the rules of interpretation. Hamilton's broad rules of interpretation are in the Federalist Papers. I mean, Hamilton never hid the way that he read the Constitution. They're already in, Publius. Mm -hmm. uh, Madison either didn't just miss them or just didn't, just didn't see what Hamilton was saying. With regard to the Alien Sedition Acts, I'm not sure you have the history exactly right. Uh, that's party building the organized opposition started before uh, the electoral campaign. Jefferson actually starts the organizing against Washington's administration while he's Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. uh, Washington never spoke to Jefferson again, as somebody pointed out in another panel, mm -hmm. uh, after all this had started, because Jefferson organized getting newspapers, uh, putting yeah. together the political party, mm -hmm. uh, and to the Federalists, what they did with regards to the Yelling Decision Acts and the other decisions made was an utterly defensive campaign against something that they saw and never anticipated would happen, which is an organized political party against the government mm -hmm. going on. And so they saw it as utterly defensive. 
that's part of the problem. Last point, uh, you're absolutely right about Madison uh, wanting to put in rules of interpretation. But at the end of the day, Hamilton wins because of John Marshall, because ultimately the government doesn't work without Hamilton's way of looking how constitutionalism works. Um, thank you. I, I mostly agree with what you say. I mean, the, 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 um, the Sedition Act was aimed at some of the very editors <laughs> that, of the papers that Jefferson created, among others. You know, so, so it's true that there was organization, but there was organization on both sides, although Hamilton didn't see his organization as against the government. I mean, Madison and Jefferson saw his organization of financial interests as against their understanding of what the government could properly do. So they saw it as every bit as dangerous as what they were counterpunching with. You know, they counterpunched with, you know, an editorial campaign to criticize those unconstitutional acts. You know, so, so I'm saying that there's, you know, that from each side's point of view, they were engaged in proper behavior. I think that's true. So, so thank you for your remarks. really just have questions of emphases about um, no role for the people in Madison's earlier views. Um, I think your points are well taken, but I wonder if you could find the two changes you identify. I wonder if you can find um, examples of those kinds of um, opinions from Madison in the earlier phase, but it's more a question of emphasis. Oh, sorry, um, for say, example, um, election of, of the um, House of Representatives. So you, uh, you already have a role for popular election um, yeah, uh, in yeah. Madison's original vision. So I'm wondering, what's the difference between that versus the later view that you can replace the whole government? Is the notion that about political party, is it, is it more that mm -hmm. you're replacing a whole regime, not just electing yeah. particular officials? Yeah. Um, and, um, and also there are parts in the, in the Federalist Papers where um, Madison's trying to respond to concerns about um, tyrannical um, national government. And when he's talking about yeah. the possibility, he always tries to reassure people by saying, well, the people um, yeah. could respond in such and such a way. And I think some of those passages he's talking about constitutional interpretation by the people. So, so my thought was that he never um, abandoned the idea from the American Revolution that constitutional interpretation is partly a popular responsibility. And wondering if you agree or disagree with that, if you, would, would that turn your two, the two new points for Madison would it yeah. more, change more about being about emphasis as opposed to, to changing? Yeah, okay, well, I, um, I guess it, there's two places I would wonder about. One is what, what is meant by no role for the people in government? It could mean government including everybody, elected, all elected officials and appointed officials, or it could mean the executive, right? The execution of things, right? So, um, and of course, it, it, the, the sentence would make sense in either case, you know, but, uh, and remember that while it was true that the members of the House of Representatives are directly elected, no one else is, or no one else is necessarily, in fact, no one else is, but no one else is e even indirectly elected at that time. So, so it's up to the states who's elected normally, right? So now that's not true of the House of Representatives, but with respect to everything else, you know, it's, it's, it's a state decision. I mean, it could be interfered with, as you know, you know, for, you know by Congress if it so chooses, but, but the expectation was the states would play a, a, an important role in choosing senators and choosing presidents, you know, which they did retain before and after this period, incidentally. You know, so, so it strikes me that there's still quite, quite a bit of distance between the conduct of government in an everyday sense and a role for the people, and I think that was understood by him and thought not to be problematic, you know? I think a big thing about Madison and that separates him and Jefferson is Madison expected the legislative process to be unproductive and hoped it would be that way. He thought the laws would be generally good and few. Hamilton thought that was crazy. Hamilton thought, no, we, we have to do lots of things. We have to be lots of statutes, you know, many legislative programs because we need to protect ourselves. We need to, you know, make it possible, facilitate industry and trade and, and build a navy and do all these things. And that's going to take legislation. So, so they had very different views about how productive the legislature should be. And if the legislature is not productive, if it's not doing things other than reacting against things, then the people aren't really playing much of a role even indirectly because the representatives are sitting there, you know, appropriating funds here and there, but not really legislating very much unless there's a plain, palpable, you know, thing that has to be corrected, which will rarely happen, you know. So I think that's kind of more of, a, of the view of a person who owns a plantation in the South, <laughs> you know, the, than, it, than it is a view of, you know, somebody living in a city who lives by his wits, you know, which Hamilton did, so...
Well, John gets the last word because we have to finish up for the, well, the let, let the next group come in. So let's give them our thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.